Hi, and once again, welcome back to the wonderful world of the scientific hypothesis. My name is Brad Alger, and in this important video, we'll answer the question of what makes for a good hypothesis. We know that all hypotheses must be explanatory and they must be falsifiable. That's what makes them hypotheses. So these two properties alone can't distinguish the better ones from the worse ones. How can we recognize, evaluate, and most importantly, how can we develop powerful, elegant, and significant hypotheses of our own? Knowing the characteristics of a good hypothesis will provide invaluable guidance when it comes to thinking about, writing about, understanding, and even doing science. All right, the five characteristics of a good hypothesis that I want to review and explain in this video are parsimony, also called simplicity, generality or significance, non-obviousness, which has been called riskiness, constraint, which the physicist David Deutsch refers to as the hard to vary criterion, and finally, practicability or actual testability. And I'm going to explain these as we go along. Now, what about falsifiability? Well, you remember that a hypothesis must make at least one prediction that if it were tested and if the results came out a certain way would mean that the hypothesis was wrong. And this is the principle of falsifiability. Now, as I've already mentioned, falsifiability is a necessary property of all genuine hypotheses, not a special characteristic of the good ones. And so we're going to assume that falsifiability is true of all of the hypotheses that we'll refer to. Now, let's look at the rule of parsimony or simplicity. What the rule says in the modern interpretation is that we should prefer the simplest hypothesis that accounts for all of the relevant data. And this implies, of course, there may be irrelevant data, which is another subject. The reason for parsimony for this rule is that there is a large number, potentially an infinite number of hypotheses that could account for any phenomenon. Moreover, each hypothesis makes a potentially infinite number of predictions. And I'll show you what I mean by that. And so therefore an efficient research program goes from simple to complex hypotheses to try to deal with this enormous number to make sense out of the possibilities that are out there. Now, because the rule of parsimony has somewhat broader implications, in some way it's more important than some of the others for understanding the hypothesis and especially a good hypothesis, I wanna spend a little bit more time on it than some of the other characteristics. So you might already be wondering, what makes for a simpler explanation? Well, it makes fewer background assumptions. It posits fewer intervening variables. It relies on more probable phenomena and has less reliance on coincidence for its explanatory power. Now, as a first illustration of parsimony, let's look at this sort of a model of a scientific problem. One day we notice that this tan ball suddenly starts moving to the left, it goes into a black tunnel and a red ball comes out the other side. And the question is, what happened? Why did that transformation occur? And one possibility, of course, a very simple one, is that the red ball was stationary inside the black tunnel and the tan ball simply knocked into it, banged into it and knocked it out. Of course, there are far more complicated hypotheses. There might, for example, be any number of other balls or different processes in the tunnel, and the tan ball simply sets them all in motion. And finally, of course, it's possible that some entirely unknown process has resulted in the material transformation of the tan ball into a red ball. If you had to pick among these different explanations, top one is the simplest one and perhaps the most likely. Nevertheless, the others are also possible. Now here's a completely different way of thinking about parsimony. Let's say we've done some experiments where we've given a drug at different doses to an organism, maybe a human being, and we're measuring changes in heart rate and we're plotting heart rate against the individual drug doses and the data that we get are shown here. Now, in trying to understand the underlying process that's actually being affected by a drug, we might draw a smooth mathematical curve through the data point, something like this. Now, in a sense, the smooth curve represents a parsimonious hypothesis that the underlying physiological process that actually affects the heart rate obeys some mathematical rule that is represented by this smooth curve. Now, notice a couple of things. For one thing, the smooth curve represents an infinite number of mathematical points. In a sense, that is an infinite number of predictions, meaning that 
for any drug dose that is represented by that mathematical line, we would get predicted changes in heart rate. We could, of course, gather more data points and plot them along the line like this as well. But how many we actually gather and how many predictions, in other words, of the hypothesis that we test is a judgment call. That means that we make a decision as to how many are enough to satisfy the needs of our experiment and to strengthen our conclusions. So the smooth curve represents the simplest explanation, but notice that the rule of parsimony does not say that the simplest explanation will be the correct one. It is quite possible to draw any of an infinite number of mathematical curves through those data points. In particular, it's possible that nature might really be like this, and the de organism's underlying mechanism of response might actually follow a mathematical function that is far more complicated than the simple one that we initially chose. In other words, the rule of parsimony also does not say that the world itself is truly simple. Clearly, however, we would prefer the simpler curve initially, and we would not start doing a whole series of experiments at drug doses down in this region on the off chance that this far more complicated curve is the true one. In other words, we prefer the simplest explanation for essentially practical reasons, not for theoretical or philosophical ones. Now we come to the second property of a good hypothesis, that is generality. And this means that the hypothesis makes predictions that apply to a wide range of cases. Here's an example from neuroscience. The hypothesis is that nerve cells or neurons communicate via chemical signals with their target cells, that is by releasing a little bit of chemical onto the target cells. This hypothesis was developed to explain nerve stimulation of heart muscle cells, which it does quite well. But it also predicted that neurons would activate other target cells, including neurons, in other parts of the body, including the brain. This hypothesis has now been tested an enormous number of times and found great support. It is accordingly a very powerful and good hypothesis. Now we consider the property of non-obviousness. Now this means that the hypothesis makes predictions that were not part of the reason to construct the hypothesis in the first place. In other words, data become available that were not available initially, and the hypothesis can also account for them. Here's an example from the history of neuroscience. The famous Spanish neuroanatomist Santiago Ramón y Cajal hypothesized that nerve cells are physically separate from one another, that is, they're independent cells. Now, his evidence for this hypothesis was entirely anatomical. It was structural. But the hypothesis also predicted that it will take measurable time for a signal to travel between nerve cells. This is a physiological property about which Cajal knew nothing. When, many years after his prediction, it became possible actually to measure the time it took from a signal to transfer from one cell to another, it was found that indeed measurable time was required. This very important but completely non-obvious prediction provided powerful support for Cabal's hypothesis. A good hypothesis should be heavily constrained by the data, or in other words, it should be hard to vary the hypothesis and still account for all of the data. An example here might be the global climate change hypothesis that says that global climate change is largely caused by human activity. Now, there is an enormous amount of data that are consistent with this hypothesis. It's made numerous predictions. They've been tested, and the hypothesis satisfactorily accounts for all of the data. There are contrary hypotheses, however, and there are some data that are consistent with them. However, these hypotheses, by and large, cannot account for the data that are explained by the hypothesis that global climate change is largely caused by human activity, and therefore, the human activity is the more powerful hypothesis. And finally, we come to practicability, which I'm also calling actual testability. What I mean by that is that hypotheses that make actually testable predictions are stronger than those that are testable only in principle. Now, the idea of falsification that I mentioned earlier 
requires only that a hypothesis be testable in principle. And here we're saying if you can actually test it, that's a better hypothesis. An example here might be the hypothesis that rising atmospheric carbon dioxide levels or CO2 levels result from human fossil fuel use. And this predicts that decreasing energy use, fossil fuel use, will decrease atmospheric CO2 levels. There is a contrary hypothesis which says that rising atmospheric CO2 levels reflect natural climate variation. And this predicts that if you wait long enough, then CO2 levels will decrease despite continued fossil fuel use by human beings. Now, both hypotheses make predictions, and it was not obvious at first how you could test either one of them. However, the global COVID-19 pandemic has made it possible to test the first hypothesis, which you recall predicts that decreasing fossil fuel use by human beings will decrease atmospheric CO2 levels. In the graph on the left, which plots global daily fossil fuel CO2 emissions against time, you'll see that for 50 years, the overall emissions increased steadily up until the year 2020, when they underwent a sudden and unprecedented drop. The emissions for the first few months of 2020 are plotted in the graph on the right, and in other data, it was shown that the decrease in emissions coincided exactly with the decrease in worldwide human fossil fuel use, that is a reduction in business activities, industry, travel, and so on. This actual test and confirmation of the prediction of the human role in rising atmospheric CO2 levels means that this hypothesis must be considered as much more powerful than the one which says that if we simply wait long enough, the levels will go down regardless of human activity. So quickly reviewing what we've been saying, a good hypothesis will obey the rule of parsimony or simplicity. It will have great generality. It will be able to make non-obvious predictions. It will be heavily constrained by the data and it will be actually possible to test its predictions. If you keep these characteristics in mind as you read scientific papers or think about scientific reports or your own scientific hypotheses, you'll not only have a better appreciation for the scientific reasoning that's involved, but you'll have a good idea of how to evaluate your own scientific thinking and reasoning. Thanks for watching. Remember to give it a thumbs up if you like it and subscribe to hear more. See you next time.